All right. Welcome, everybody, to the session on uh, layer profiles. Uh, my name is Vitimir Kwanovic. I'm a senior lecturer at University of South Australia. And today with, uh, I, uh, with me, I have a, a wonderful guest that will be talking about uh, learner profiles. So I'll just briefly introduce everybody first and while people are joining in, and then we're going to uh, kick off the session. So first of all, we have um, Tony Sims, who is the assistant principal and uh, Henley High School in uh, Henley Beach in, in uh, Adelaide. And uh, then we have uh, Hassan Mekavi, who is a program manager at SAIS Board of South Australia, heavily involved uh, with the development of uh, SAIS Board's uh, Learner Profile Project. And then also we have Rebecca Maron, who is a researcher at University of South Australia, uh, working actually close uh, with uh, Tony and uh, some of the other local schools on uh, development of learner profiles. So, um, as you know, uh, there have been um, recently very, you know, learner profiles became quite a hot topic and uh, in a bunch of different uh, education systems, schools, organizations, universities, you name it, have been working on developing learner profiles. And really what we wanted today uh, to have is to have a chat from different perspectives of people who are involved in development of profiles, whether from academic side or from the side of a school or uh, or one of those uh, large organizations doing uh, the adoption of profiles, and to really see what what are the some of the you know uh, opportunities for the future collaborations, uh, opportunity you know what are the things that were working, things that weren't working so well, and and so on, and also really uh, given the the topic of this conference, obviously on uh, use of artificial intelligence, to see what kind of where what is the role of AI in in all of this, because uh, whether we want it or not is coming to education, obviously, and it's not really do we want to have AI in the classroom or not? We're gonna have it, so it's it's really not the question do we want or not. It's just how we're gonna use it and. Um, and uh, you know for what purpose so uh with that being said let's let's maybe uh kick off uh with some of the very um basic uh quick introductions from everybody just in terms of the profiles work uh maybe start off with uh, i don't know Hassan. do you want to kick off sure thanks vita uh yeah as vita said we're here at the size board We've been working for a long time in terms of our strategic plan to really focus on a more holistic view of an individual student's success at education and particularly at senior secondary education and the idea of assessment and valuing of student capabilities and then through the visualization of a learner profile was really attractive for us in terms of transforming educational outcomes and looking particularly at uh, different me uh, metrics for success and so we understand that a breadth of students come from a range of different backgrounds and more importantly are going to different pathways and so therefore uh, we, our problem was looking for a solution to try and support the most disadvantaged students to have some meritocracy in education looking at where they were going past their pathways and so we thought the capabilities and learner profile was a right way to go then we were supported by clearly international directions in terms of education through the OECD and other countries but also through our national sheer gold uh, review into uh, senior secondary education. So we were really supported by that. And we're sort of two years into a six year plan into looking at how we might introduce learner profiles to complement students senior secondary um, learning and certificates, but also to provide data to post school pathway providers. So tertiary institutions, how might they use that capabilities data to inform better matching for tertiary entrances, but also for industry, how might the capabilities data better inform their recruitment processes. So we've been working with a small group of schools. We've had a successful pilot first year. As Vita said, some really good learnings and opportunities, but also some challenges and risks that we're hoping to scale up into our second pilot next year. Thanks, Hassan. Uh, Tony, you wanna go off? Yeah, uh, look, we, we know that the SACE ball was working on uh, developing some sort of capabilities measure and, and uh, having that learner profile as part of the, you know, end of year 12 sort of uh, certificate. Um, 
I suppose for us, we sort of started looking at this uh, when the opportunity came up to work with UniSA. And our initial thoughts were that we wanted to use learner profiles to have some sort of measure of capabilities. Um, when we started doing that work, we realised that we didn't really have a measure for capabilities um, and we weren't too sure how we'd gather that data. So the project has sort of taken a bit of a sidestep, but not, not unwarranted. Um, schools have a lot of data. Uh, and unfortunately, that data is in lots of different places. And so what we've essentially started doing is uh, mining all that data, collecting all that data together so that teachers can get that data in one place. So we've got a system set up where teachers can use a, a Power BI tool where they can see the students' NAPLAN results, the PAT results, uh, all of their grades, uh, historical grades as well as current grades, their attendance, uh, and even some uh, more fine-grained PAT information from uh, the reading and maths tests. So in order for teachers to uh, teach better, I suppose, they need to know the students in their class. And so this is a way of giving the data to the teachers so they get to know the students better, so that they can adapt their course and content better, um, so that we can obviously get a, a better results. <clears throat> Having come down that path, we are now looking at what are the other um, important bits of information that gives us a, a whole picture of the student as, as opposed to just the academics. So we've uh, recently done a creativity task with all our students and we're about to uh, assess that and, and put that information into the tool to say, uh, give the kids a score about creativity. We've spoken about uh, well-being and, and mental health data and how we get that and get that stuff into our tool. So it's really about getting a well-rounded picture of the student, um, not just academically, but how they're travelling, how capable they are. And then if we know where the strengths and weaknesses are, then we can work uh, towards um, differentiating in the class or personalising the curriculum so that we can support students to be more successful. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Rebecca, what about from your end in terms of as somebody who is uh, from academic side of things? What do you see uh, the, the value for, for academics and, and, you know, universities and other researchers being involved in things like this? Sure. Thanks, Vida. Um, I guess I come from, um, so as Vida said, I, I'm a, a researcher, I'm an academic um, at UniSA. Uh, I come from an educational psychology background. And so I think the ability to combine all these individual data sets, as Tony said, the data sits in silos and it's not very well integrated or very well used. And um, typically when we look at um, research that's done on students, it's either higher ed um, or it's kind of that senior secondary level. But with a learner profile, we can really drill down into those kids the minute they enter school. Um, and so we can start having really tailored and specific approaches to how we can support children's learning across a variety of areas and throughout their schooling journey and beyond. I think it provides an opportunity to not just have little touch points as academics as well, where we come in and we, you know, run a survey or an intervention and we have a pre-post, but that longitudinal data is gold. Um, we can start using some more of those sophisticated techniques around the predictive analytics and, and so forth. But I really just think it gives us a holistic picture of how students and how um, kids through to adults and then into the workforce uh, are tracking. And for an academic to have real-time deeply rich, um, you know, relatively unbiased, so use that loosely, I guess, we're, because we're having so much data. Um, I think that that's just fantastic from an academic point of view, but I think the, the key point to it for me is that we have the opportunity to intervene and actually have an impact on these students' lives beyond a pre-post or beyond a, a small-scale project that we, we typically see academics run with schools. Thanks, Rebecca. So I, I guess, no, I think there's a couple of interesting points mentioned uh, uh, from Hassan's point of, yep, we want to give students, you know, a certain record and to, to, to have, uh, you know, they can take to employers or take to universities, wherever they are going after. And, and also then from uh, Tony's side, well, we wanted to step back a bit earlier so we can develop students to, to have uh, more time, I guess, to, to develop them. 
Uh, what do you think was uh, should be, I guess, the driving force really? Uh, uh, what what is the driving force with these with these uh, projects? Uh, whether it's uh, uh, accreditation or, or certification of knowledge or more developmental thing. Uh, Hassan, I guess maybe uh, you know whoever wants to just jump in, guys. Sure, I'll have a start. So our key driver primarily is better learning outcomes for young people. And what we do see is the current, and I'm sure we all know this story, the current, you know, our narrative around successor and education, unfortunately, is dominated by the ATAR. Uh, and that means that, you know, for the 20 or 30% of students where that suits, uh, it's they've got something, even though it's a rank and it does have its own issues. And we also hear from tertiary institutions then right across the country that it's not often the best predictor or best matcher for students for individual courses. Our other concern is that clearly for 70% of students, that, that ATA doesn't provide a really good culmination of their education. And for some even worse in terms of their well-being, it doesn't really capture the success that they've had over 30 years of education. It feels like my whole education has been refined to two decimal points and I don't fit into that and I don't belong so therefore I'm not successful and I know that's a loose narrative so we're focusing on really capturing and highlighting the success of those capabilities that the students do have and then the richness of what they can contribute to the community as a, as a citizen no matter if they're in unemployment employment further or higher education and more importantly for them to have the language to be able to articulate in terms of the capabilities that they possess that they might not know they possess. So I think for me, that's the driver really in terms of greater belonging and engagement with education and seeing the value for the future. So our primary purpose is creating a learner profile for the young person and their family, but we have to be cognizant that that learner profile should have some currency for future use. Uh, there's no point making it great for the young person and looking good for them if they can't then use that as a ticket somewhere else. So it's got to be a both end for us. There was a question in the chat about um, the capabilities. So that when I talk about the capabilities, I'm talking about the Australian curriculum capabilities and the SAIS capabilities, which are literacy, numeracy, ethical understanding, intercultural understanding, digital literacy, uh, critical and creative thinking. But for us, that, that's sort of a starting point, but that's not the be-all and end-all necessarily of the capabilities. Um, you know, things like collaboration, problem-solving, are they self-directed learners? What are their character strengths? Um, those types of things, I, I suppose, are things that we'd be looking into as well in terms of a learner profile. Um, and those are the things that spread across all subject areas, Not and uh, whereas a grade for a subject or an ATAR is really related to the particular subject content knowledge. So it's probably those types of things that employers are saying that they want to know uh, the skills that students have in that area uh, and perhaps not necessarily the score they got for maths. So it's it's stuff they can use across the board and they can use across a whole range of different fields when they do leave school. Yeah, uh, um, one, one question then there's a, uh, uh, let's uh, throw a curveball then. Uh, <laughs> um, so, the one problem, for example, it's similar when you now mention skills and uh, and capabilities and so on. There's always been for, for quite a while now the push towards more competency-based education and, uh, you know, chunking up things into smaller bits. One problem that's always uh, there was, okay, how are we going to do that? Because you can define, let's say you have a big skill of, you know, customer relationship. And now you're going to, your university providing that training for example in customer relationship you can chunk it up into a million different ways and and and, and it's very hard to create almost like a one authoritative truth of what these are the components because it's it's uh, if we want to enable movement of people between the organization you know you learn one thing in one place then another thing in another place then three years later you use something else there is this problem of having the common uh, or common taxonomy of things. And I guess similarly here, let's say somebody finishes uh, in South Australia and gets the South Australian Certificate of Education showing that he has, let's say, ethical understanding. But now he moves to, I don't know, Singapore when they have their own learner profile and there is no ethical understanding, but there is, I don't know, principled action or whatever, you're going to, some other term that they might have used for their own purpose. Uh, obviously, the things are not matching. So, 
how we should develop those, you know, Hassan, from your end, maybe uh, because you were doing more with capabilities, what, what's the process of developing those constructs? How, you know, are they just, how did you come up with the list of, of, of things to be there? Yeah, so the first thing we decided is we know that the even the nomenclature, what you said, how did you decide, was going to be fairly controversial in terms of the names, but we know everyone was working on this across the world, um, you know, for the last five or ten years, education reform right across the world. You know, Brookings did a great map of the capability development and curriculum innovation right across the world. And the terms, you know, we're going to be interchangeable. Whether you call it teamwork, collaboration, group work, whatever it might be, essentially the constructs underneath that are going to be very similar. So we agreed at the very beginning that we weren't going to worry so much about the name, that we were going to focus on essentially the intent of those capabilities. And we could see whether they were the five R's, the six S's, you know, the four W's, it didn't really matter. We were just going to focus on them because what we knew is they they weren't the biggest risks. Yeah, that the biggest risk isn't what you call this thing, but it could have been a huge blocker if we spent a lot of time deciding what it is. We know the biggest risk is gonna come with um, assessment, reliability, validity, and quality assurance. So we wanted to focus on that and get straight into that rather than conceptually worried about what they're going to be called. So once we sort of came up with the, the large area buckets, we did work with the Assessment Research Centre at Melbourne University who were working on assessment of complex competencies to start thinking about a methodology. We were lucky in South Australia. We have been working in standards reference assessment for over 12 years. So teachers were able and practised in looking at evidence versus standards and making really good professional holistic on-balance judgments. So we wanted to extend that. So largely, we started then working with them about how we would build the constructs in terms of their structure. And the primary thing was they were developmental. So there is this idea that we've developed the constructs, some of the dimensions or elements of those constructs, and some of the behavioural observable characteristics of each of those elements, and then four levels of progression. So that was something that our constructs are built on but the most important thing was we work with our stakeholders then to determine what were the most valued capabilities right now. So we do acknowledge they are currently contemporary Western constructs. So this is just what's interesting and popular now. That could change and we're open to changing. But we spoke to our teachers and our students and then our tertiary partners and also our industry partners to go, what are the most valued qualities or behaviours that you are seeing in young people that are recent graduates that you think education should contribute to uh, developing and supporting and providing time for, then basically we put all those together and that's how we arrived at our current five capabilities, which I said are just for the pilot. We're very open to changing them depending on how um, the community responds, but that's where we are right now. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, I don't know, Rebecca, maybe what you, I was thinking, you know, your view from, from scholarly side of, of defining the constructs and so on. What, yeah, so I mean, to take Tony's example before about how we would measure creativity in students at his school, we used an empirically valid creativity task. Um, and so what we can do with that is use it. So it's a, it's a drawing task and it just gives an overall measure of the student's creative potential. Now, in Australia, with our capabilities, we have critical and creative thinking. So we started with creative thinking because that's one of my areas of research. And I know that the test is valid and reliable. Now what we're doing is using that as a benchmark. Um, so we're creating, sorry, excuse me, <clears throat> broadening our, um, uh, not our definition of creativity, but to include critical thinking as well into our further assessments of critical and creative thinking of students at the school. And we'll be able to validate our proposed task um, by benchmarking it against this empirically valid creativity task. Um, and so what we hope is we will be able to drill down into really subject specific critical and creative thinking skill. So um, a student could be competent and critical and creative thinking in science and less so in English. And we'll be able to, over time, be able to, to go even deeper and say they, you know, can critically think in poetry, but not so much in essay writing. And so we're really trying to not just have domain general 
ideas of the competencies, but really domain specific. And the way that we do that is we take something that's, you know, um, valid in the research world and we apply it to the context um, of, of the classroom or the students of the subject and, and kind of take it from there. Um, and we intend to do that with all of the, the competencies um, alongside other, I guess, goals of the schools that we're working with and in line with their strategic plans as well. We take something that's um, in the academic world and we just use it in the, in the context of the classroom. Thanks, Rebecca. Tony, uh, from your perspective, what do you think is, is the, for me personally, coming as a researcher, so, oh, it's very, very critical how do you define those things? Like, that's my view because, you know, as a grad student, I was getting uh, my ass lab because of being slacked, uh, you know, sloppy with the terms and definitions. But uh, is that a problem for teachers? Is that like, a, is that a, maybe a problem or uh, it's more of a, you know, how do we measure these things? Because you mentioned that, but it, is you know, from, from a practitioner side of things. So, I mean, that's always the way. If you if you say we're going to measure something, then the question from teachers is, well, how are we going to measure it? How are we going to moderate that? How are we going to ensure that there's, um, you know, it stands up to, to scrutiny? Um, but taking a step back, I, I suppose for me, it, it's whether it's skills, capabilities, whatever you want to call those things, um, it's what, what's the information that teachers need to be able to better apply uh, whatever they're doing in the classroom to the current students they have. What's going to help them make the experience for students in the classroom better? And then for students, I suspect, what, what is it that they need to know about themselves so that then they can work on themselves in the areas that they might think they need or, or they know their strengths and they work to their strengths? And then, of course, you know, towards the end at year 12, if there's a, a measure of capabilities or skills, whatever they are, what are those things that are going to support them to move on to the career that they have? And those things might be different from class to class, school to school, state, international, you know, it, it depends on the context, I suppose. Um, and so it's really difficult to decide what is it you want to put in the profile. And then the harder bit after that is, then how are you going to assess it accurately and, and put a measure to it? Excellent, excellent comment by Simon Atkinson. Actually, just on this on on this uh, topic of, uh, and you, Tony, touched on that. You know, should we have one, you know, one profile to to fit everybody, or you know, one size doesn't fit all, or is it something that we want to have as one unified profile, uh, whether for a state level, country level, you know, international or whatever, or do we want to have where? I mean, it's obvious that you, you, what you, Tony, you mentioned. There is certain needs to be flexibility. The schools are different. The needs of a remote school versus a, a you know prestigious uh, private school are different. Uh, school. Yeah, exactly. So, so all, all of those things. How do we? Do, what are the some of the uh, ways we can do that? Is are we do that personal uh, customization if you want through the constructs, through the measures, through the I don't know, teaching activities, what would be the way to, to, to achieve that? Because as, as, as you said, it, it, it is, their needs are different. So how, how to do that? I suppose Hassan also spoke about, you know, the changing nature of employment and stuff and something that's important today uh, might not be important tomorrow. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> flexibility and ag being agile in that space is probably really important as well. Um, and look, from a, from a system point of view, of course, if you want to, put something across system wide, there's got to be some sort of standard and, and some sort of commonality across the board. But um, once you've got that standard, if, if there was an opportunity to expand that out to match the context of where that system is going, uh, then that's probably the key, I suppose. And how do you do that? Mm, that's a good question. And that's the question we're grappling with in terms of you know measuring of capabilities or skills or soft skills, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. If you if you say I want to measure in critical and creative thinking, then you have to have some sort of measure to be able to do that. That's that's robust, I suppose. Yeah, if I can jump on that, uh, Vito. So I guess um, Tony's right. We're looking at a system level solution for South Australia, but really we're starting out because we wanted to get the ball rolling. We understand that people have been talking about this for a long time, and there's been no real action. And what we decided is to go with a model to start to have these conversations and to have this conversation based on um, 
you know, some evidence base, whether it was anecdotal, whether it was uh, action research, whether it was qualitative and quantitative, we can start to understand the experiences. So our goal was to at least get something, some sort of draft capabilities developed so we could start working with schools to uncover some of the really risky and challenging um, barriers to, you know, scaling this any broader. And so what we understand is that if we'd like to go to a national learner profile, as you suggest, maybe not international yet, but a national one, what would that look like? So, you know, Tony talked about the difference between primary and secondary, and you talked about regional and metro. Well, of course, we know um, our, you know, national education system is really interesting in terms of the different jurisdictions. So how can we then move towards a national learner profile approach when every jurisdiction has a very strong identity and history in the different states and territories? And how can we come up to a solution that is flexible and agile that will give not only the students confidence of its, um, I guess, transferability, but also the tax, I guess, in terms of the tertiary entrance centres and then employers or other stakeholders across the state. So we are very open to that. What the SAFE Board are very clearly doing is we're going down a really phased pilot approach. I talked about, you know, two years into a five or six year plan. And so once we start gaining momentum and conversation through events like this, we'll start to start to influence where we move next. So we might trial a flexible option next. We might trial a school having a specific capability that sits towards the specific cultural vision of their school. We might be a mix and match. You know, maybe we have a smorgasbord of capabilities, something like eight or ten, and then you choose five that best suit your school. That's something we're very open to. But if we start those conversations without some of the other fundamental challenges, you know, being addressed, we'll start to have too many variables. So that's why we're starting tight on five for the system. But we're very open once the community has buy-in for the conversation and the narrative to us to look at a really different model that suits their flexibility. Yeah, thanks. So, so what? I, and there was a comment of of the sales boards. Uh, very open and, and uh, innovative minds. And that's been quite, to be honest, in Australia, in South Australia, we are a bit uh, used to that. So we, were, we have all, we, we're a bit uh, you know, spoiled in that sense, in terms of the uh, uh, being really a good place to, to research um, innovative approaches to education because, because of, of the openness of the system level players of, uh, of doing things like that. So uh, now moving, uh, well, one thing just that's, before that's, we move uh, off on that, yeah. can I just add something? Sorry, um, I mean, what role do universities play in what types of things we might measure? Because we know that the ATAR is the be all and end all to get into university, um, and that's sort of managed by the by them. Um, and I know that universities are starting to move away from the ATAR. We've got Year 11s getting offers for university based on the Year 11 results, not an ATAR. Um, I know that universities are looking for that capability type uh, information as well about students. So I suppose a, a question, uh, you know, how much are the universities driving this change in schools as well? Vida, I think you're probably better placed to, to take that one, actually. Uh, well, uh, I mean, both of us can talk about that, but I guess one thing that's interesting, you mentioned that it, ATAR is getting less important, and why? Well, you have far more international students. They don't come with any any of that. Uh, there's also different, all kinds of different alternative pathways. And yes, it's becoming less important. However, uh, there is at some point, at, 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 at one way or another, some form of evaluation of students that, that, that exists. And then uh, this is uh, this is I think where these kind of things can help us. Now uh, the same thing will happen again uh, if the, if. But this is you know starting a conversation eventually. Like every pretty much wherever the student comes from, you're gonna have a GPA student. Like this is no way that you're gonna come without a GPA or without a great transcript. So if these things kind of eventually you know 10, 20 years from now, 10 years from now, let's say, uh, move to become more common, well, you might say, yeah, you're going to have a learner profile from a student from Indonesia. Uh, it won't be matching to the things that, I don't know, Australia is doing, but, you know, you at least have something to, 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 to work. Uh, that's uh, now all the other shady moves with year 11 offers and other, that, that, that's another conversation. But um, it, it, in overall, that's, the, that's, the, that's where I think 
we we need these things uh interesting though is how much you know we talk about pathways and 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 uh, you know getting to university but this is you know education is lifelong these days i mean nobody's expected to you know get a job and you know that, that that's you know you're set for life so you're you're expected to be coming back to the uni or to have some workplace training and all of that so um is there what, what are your thoughts on on expanding the the scope and the the use of these profiles to be more like a lifelong record like like have your medical record you know almost like you have your learner record or something like that that would you know carry that you would carry with you all you know through life and uh, through all of the other learning settings um i don't know to hear your thoughts on that maybe it's fine if your record's great <laughs> And we, we have trouble getting the data together for schools, let alone having something that goes with you for life. So um, interesting. From our perspective, Vita, I guess we know that there is a thought about a national learner profile project that sits at senior secondary, but everyone we've been engaging with, as, as Tony's saying for his school, is that, you know, you can't start here. So for those of you that are interstate or international, the SACE board really only has a remit looking after year 11 and 12 and the senior secondary certificate, we don't have jurisdiction over uh, reception or primary or middle years. And so, but everyone talking to us is saying, it looks great at senior secondary, but it's got to start earlier, not only in terms of the developmental language of the process, but in terms of our students and our teachers looking about what are the pedagogical changes, what are the teaching and learning changes in order to provide opportunities to evidence their capabilities. So there is, I think, um, an interest and an appetite for uh, you know, birth to 12 uh, learner profile. And I don't know how that might work, but also clearly, as you talk about, they're very closely matched to the uh, university graduate qualities, or if you match them to employability skills, there's strong alignment there. And I'm not sure, you know, people are interested in blockchain, whatever it might be, you know, something that sits on my gov as, a, as something you do carry as, as a badge. And I think there's opportunities there I think the blocker right now is this idea about the trust and confidence in the reliability of that data. And that's really interesting place for me. So we're really keen to look at what another one, what a longer sort of uh, journey might be. And I think we can track that. Um, but as we're saying, we're hoping to start at senior secondary, hope to provide an evidence base and hope to provide some really provoking emerging learnings to get people to start asking those bigger questions. Can we trust teacher judgment? Do we all need to use an empirically tested uh, test in order to judge this? Or do we acknowledge that teachers are seeing these students every day? They're really well placed to make decisions about students' uh, academic achievement, but also their capabilities. And then how do we quality show that evidence when some of it is really indirect and intangible? And how can we trust teachers to be able to make those decisions? That's the biggest thing for us that we're dealing with right now. Can I just add something to that? Because I think what sits alongside it is um, the notion of like data literacy, um, AI literacy, all of those new fancy words, including, you know, the word literacy and making sure that we have an adequate understanding and um, approach to how we're using, how we're storing and what this data and information is being used for. So I think alongside a learner profile has to come education and that has to be education on what data is being collected, how it's informing decisions who has access to that and I think that that has to be as holistic as the profile so the student or the child themselves has to be aware the parent has to be aware the teacher the school system the university and and so forth and so I think that it's a um a process that will take a, a significant amount of time and effort um to upskill communities and if we're talking about a national profile than Australia um, to feel comfortable ha having having these conversations and understanding it um, and and I think once we have a, like an increase in understanding then we can see an increase in comfortability and maybe the more we're more likely to use it and have increased trust in those that will be making um, those decisions about those cap capabilities or competencies or skills or whatever we want to call them.
I have one uh, just following building up on, on what what you guys said is uh, the 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 well the you know, the trust into in, into the whole thing and uh, one common thing as a researcher that always annoys me is we use the good instrument we pick a good instrument let's say there is one famous in the, in online education called community of inquiry fam- fantastic instrument for measuring uh, cr- uh, critical thinking although it's for inquiry based learning. And the thing about it is you need to have an environment in which you put the students into an inquiry process, then you can make sense out of the, the things that the instrument is doing. And now you can come, it's not hard to, de- I mean, it's not easy, but it's possible to develop good instruments. But those instruments always develop, always depend heavily on the environment, on the task, on the learning setting and all of those things. And that's much, much more challenging to make sure it's, uh, it's the same. So, you know, um, say or whoever doesn't matter can develop a set of instruments, but where you know how, uh, Tony, maybe from your perspective on how hard is to teach for development of those capabilities in terms of like this is fine we can develop we let's say we agree on the structure of those and what should be in them and all of that like when we come and we have a good instrument we have the the levels and all of that nicely set up with the progressions which all of is very hard. How do you going to, te- you know, you come to the classroom, to the teacher, like, you know, how hard is it to do that? Uh, good question. <laughs> um, you know, we, we make all sorts of plans and goals and strategies for what we want to see in the classroom. Does that happen all the time in every classroom? Probably not. <clears throat> so we're, at our school in particular, we're really uh, going a bit fine grain starting next year in that we are really wanting to, we don't want any general observations classroom, we really want specifics about what's happening in the classroom. So if one of our goals is to um, make sure that everyone's doing learning intentions and assess criteria, if I have a meeting with the maths coordinator and he says, yeah, everybody's doing it, it's fine, uh, I really want to know of the 10 people he's supervising, who's doing it, who's doing it all the time, who's not doing it, who needs support to do it, what supports do we need to put in place if that's one of our strategies and goals. So to, to, do, to make sure anything happens in the classroom, I think you have to have the structures in place to observe, to gather the evidence and the data and to have the support structures in place to get teachers to uh, be able to do what it is that you're asking. It's no good just saying, right, we're going to do that, go and do it because uh, nine out of 10 people won't do it and the other one will probably struggle to do it without any support or any training or, or knowing that people have got their back, I suppose. So uh, anything is difficult in a classroom, but it's about having the structures to make sure that it's happening or what do you need to do to make it happen? Just to uh, maybe follow up for everybody, what do you think AI's role can be there? Can we use AI for that, and in what ways? Because that's a, that's a, you know okay. So if it is hard to teach for those some of the things, well, can we leverage? And I mean, by AI, I mean the broader technologies, like you know, fancy modern technologies, which in the future more and more often will have some intelligent component. What are your thoughts on that? Yes and no. So I think we just encounter the same issues. Um, AI literacy, um, you know, like the understandability, the trust, the explainability, the so forth. I think we just encounter the same issues. And I think it has similar solutions as in we need to be trained in understanding what AI is capable of, how it can work, um, where its strengths and its weaknesses lie. I mean, if you're on the Sense AI panel last night, we spoke about how um, the role of the teacher is is changing um, and what the, the modern or the emerging teacher looks like is less about imparting knowledge and more about supporting students to achieve their potential. But how can we have an AI system to impart knowledge all the time when our teaching is differentiated, it's flexible, it has to be dependent on all types of context and the current AI technology is just not there yet it'll get there but it's not there yet and then you human in the loop and and all of those things i think we just come back to the to the same problems we have with just putting anything new into a classroom or into a conversation whether that's a learner profile an ai agent whatever it is um so i think it has potential and promise and it will definitely 
integrate into classrooms and into, into education systems more broadly, but I think we still encounter the same challenges. From a system perspective, I think for us, if we go back to the idea of the challenge of reliability of teacher data and evidence and even teacher bias and perspective, we know assessment is very subjective and it's a human process and we can try and, you know, minimise um, the variance. But what we really see, uh, particularly AI um, and, and maybe some of the, the big data sets is thinking about what else is out there that can corroborate what teachers are seeing. So we're saying, yes, um, on some cases, we really trust teachers. But unfortunately, for a lot of parents and students, maybe there's that lack of trust. So how do we then be able to say, oh, I only got this particular score on my learner profile because my teacher doesn't like me. And that's going to something we receive right now. Why well, I got an A minus instead of an A plus. And so there's always that human relation in interaction. What I think we're missing is this really great um, access to a whole range of data that's out there that we are not utilising and accessing and how we can be able to sort of think about usurping that to corroborate, to identify um, things that students are doing that teachers may not be aware of, or at least to identify other patterns that um, students are participating in or engaging in that may not be aware of, that might be able to stimulate or corroborate teachers' professional um, judgments and decisions. That's in terms of corroborating the data. In terms of teaching and learning opportunities, you know, I mean, I'm not sure, I'm not an expert in this area, but, you know, things like VR and AR, really opportunities to really shift the way the teaching and learning program. So Rebecca talked about less, you know, content-driven teacher-led curriculum to student-led and, and a lot of student agency and how can they simulate opportunities and activities to not only um, allow students to, to show what they know but to show that they can do with what they know. And I think those opportunities then allow to have evidence of capabilities. I'm, you know, imparting my technical subject discipline knowledge, but I'm also implementing it and transferring it amongst, you know, group work, creative thinking, critical thinking, ethical behaviour, and that's coming into that richer task that, you know, virtual reality or augmented reality might be able to create an opportunity for. Yeah, definitely. That was more of what I was thinking of, you know, once uh, one thing is to have a data, right, to have more accurate data. And that also talks to with Tony's initial point of where we want to collect the data that can be used then together with profiles and together with the competency data, but also about the teaching and learning side of things. You know, you want to develop students, I don't know, intercultural understanding in mathematics, well, you know, in let's say in languages, and, you know, you develop a VR environment in which students talk to AI agents who are foreigners or something like that, learning about culture and things like that. So you could develop far more powerful uh, uh, systems that would allow us to demonstrate, like to create environments for demonstrating those capabilities. Because in many, many ways, I guess one, one thing that comes, you know, one challenge is the, the having an assessment or, and having the learning activities that can, you know, help the, in which students can exhibit uh, and showcase and demonstrate those capabilities. And that's where I guess the, the, the challenge, you know, you cannot demonstrate, I think, you know, so much, there's so much you can do with writing an essay, right? There's, there's, I mean, you can demonstrate ethical understanding, but not so much if you, if you, if you do other things, right? So um, that's, that's where, is, uh, where, is the, where is the challenge. And I guess AI could be, um, could be used there. Rebecca, do you have, I mean, given that you were working most, do you have specific maybe capabilities and skills where AI, I don't know, so, so some do you think where we should see mostly use of these technologies? Yeah, so I think in as the role of an assistant. So again, going back to the creativity task. Um, so when we get humans to score that task, it takes about 30 minutes to score each test. If you're paying an academic researcher, you know, a school of a thousand students, you're looking at 10 grand worth of cost and six months to get those um, uh, scores back back to you. 
AI, and we've successfully done this, we can, we've trained an algorithm to assess creativity based on this task through Google's Teachable Machine. So through uh, free-to-use software that we've eliminated the, the time needed and the cost. So it's flexible, it's dynamic, you can get a result instantly or much, much quicker than humans. And the algorithm is as accurate as human judges. The more data we feed it, the more accurate it's going to become. So I think in that instance, it's it's an assistant. It can help speed up the creative process and therefore you just have access to that information earlier and you can do more with it. So I really see AI in, in that assistant role um, and supporting teachers or supporting learners in the classroom. And I suppose alongside what Rebecca's talking about in terms of that creativity measure, <clears throat> yes, you can have a measure and you can have it on a learner profile, but then what do you do with it? What do the teachers do with that number? Um, how do they improve students' capability or can they can they improve it? Um, or how do they use it to their advantage if they're, if they're highly creative? So it's really about what you do with that data. Yeah, I'll just add something to that as well. The more data we get, the more holistic the student profile is, the more we can use things like predictive analytics to give specific, specific tailored feedback to the student. So we can say, um, hey, look, you you um, were less creative in English on, again, poetry, but you've demonstrated higher creativity in mathematics, in specific to algebra like you start to get a, a way more detailed look at a student's ability and capability and then you could suggest you know to a teacher hey this student seems to benefit more from a stem integrated approach as opposed to just science or just mathematics that's how they seem to demonstrate their creativity or critical thinking more efficiently um, and so I think it can then give detailed and directed feedback as well and that's how it can be used so it can be used as another Again, I see it as an assistant, but a, a tool in a teacher's tool belt um, of how how to how to use it in the classroom. Interesting comment. Thanks, Rebecca, from from Tony, is about what what you do with that. Asan, do you have maybe some of given that you had the first run of the pilot? What are teachers? And I'm just I'm taking broadly, of course, depends on the competency and the school and then you know involvement of teacher and everything. But what are the some of the uh, experiences do they pe do people see that being useful for intervention or hey this is great by doing this I was able to do something or I see a way or at least I see an opportunity for for it because if 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 we want to have them you know grow and develop we have to do something that Tony is right if you're just going to put the number even put the nicest and the most detailed stamp on them if you're just putting a stamp you're not really doing much so. Any, any thoughts on the you know, existing experience? Yeah, so our early experiences really have focused on teachers really conceptualising the assessment of capabilities and then the impact for their pedagogical practice. So I think at the moment it's really been focusing on starting on do I understand these frameworks, do I understand what it means for me to see these frameworks, or the, the, these capabilities. So the first thing we focused on was noticing a capability when they saw it and then valuing it in unexpected places. So you talked about an essay. We saw very clearly in our, you know, major tasks, if you like, summative tasks, there's very little um, affordance for capabilities. So we're saying, don't look there. Where are you going to look then? And it's a really between the teaching and learning program, the formative assessment, the whole, you know, activity building up to that, that's where the richness is that comes in in terms of the evidence of capabilities. And therefore, you could strongly influence that in terms of your changing practice. So if I was very uh, driven by uh, individual students doing individual work and making it very competitive, then I'm not going to have a lot of affordances for this collaborative work, this collective engagement, this intercultural understanding, this richness and empathy. But if I change my pedagogical practice, that still allowed the same outcome and encourage group work, encourage students to connect with people internationally, encourage people to work together, then all of a sudden, with a slight change, I'm actually creating more affordances for these capabilities, particularly for the ones I see that me as a teacher, I'm not creating the environment for, or all the ones that I can see in my students need greater development of. So I think they've started seeing that. They went from, do I know these capabilities and can I assess them to, am I currently providing opportunities for them? And if not, what do I need to do to change? 
and then how can I target that specifically? And what we saw is small instances of actually student-driven empowerment to sort of say, actually, my capability score is low on, um, let's say, intercultural understanding. Do you think for this project, sir, miss, can I really have an international focus and lens on it so I can partner with an international person because I want to focus on that aspect of my capability? And so we saw then the students driving um, how they um, evidence their learning for the discipline, but also how they can provide opportunities for evidence of that capability as well. So that was unexpected, but really pleasant uh, learning. And again, it was small scale, two or three examples, but it's sort of the things that we're looking for. Can I just bring that back to the idea of AI as well in this, um, you know, the, the latest updates that came out last week from GPT-3 and how it can just generate all these essays that you wouldn't even know, you know, was written by an AI agent and um, it's, it's going to change how we look at assessment just quite quickly and quite dramatically. How are we going to be running these things throughout plagiarism software and, and, and all of that. And so we're going to be seeing, I think, at a university level, but in schools as well, a shift in how we are assessing um, skills. And it'll be a shift away from some of those more traditional essay outputs or and a move towards some of those formative ideas where the students also get an opportunity to say, hey, I want to work on my intercultural understanding. And so I think AI in that regard, um, by upskilling in that area has lessened the need for us to have skills in how to produce an essay and more in some of those competencies um, that that can that can be a massive change, I think. Absolutely. And and that's what, this is where I wanted maybe to get you know, we are close to the end of the session, maybe ask you guys for some of the you know final thoughts and 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 I guess advice for people who want to whether from the side of the school or side of the you know, uh, system-wide, uh, uh, system level or researcher level, uh, you know, how to approach the, this whole uh, topic of learner profiles and, and uh, uh, yeah, any, any final advice and comments and, you know, uh, advice in, in, in that area, how, 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 you know, how to first approach these things. I suppose for us as a school, um, ours was probably more of an organic approach. We, we didn't start out by debating what we were going to have in a learner profile. We sort of said, well, we've got this data, let's get that in. And now we, and then we, you know, we've met every week to talk about that, that tool. How can we change it? How can we make it better? Let's get rid of that. Let's add that. Um, so we've, we've sort of organically developed the tool based on what we've seen as we've gone along and, and sort of decided what was useful, what's not useful. Um, and I think our next steps are to do all that, you know, look at that sort of capability side of things now that we've got the, the basic data in. So <clears throat> probably my advice is just start. Start somewhere. Uh, you don't know where it's going to end up, um, but, you know, you can debate it forever and, and never get anywhere. So just make a start and, and get, get moving. Thanks, Tony. I hope that's what we've done. Just make a start and get it out there and have a conversation. But I'd like to use the last few minutes to probably address one of the comments in the chat about, you know, we're just shifting the competition from content knowledge to capability competition. And so we've been very deliberate in raising that idea and shifting the perception of education. So we've been very clear and deliberate in being provocative in saying we don't believe at SACE that education is a competition. We're not naive in terms of seeing what the competitive markets are out there, but we are doing education and learning for learning's sake and the understanding that every young person has a right to education to develop deep discipline knowledge. So please, not, let's not getting wrong, we're not taking away from discipline knowledge. That's more important than ever. It's discipline knowledge and capabilities that we're trying to shift. And the way we're trying to move away from the competition is that it's looking at the student's unique profile. It's a jagged profile is what we've got. If you think about all our panellists and all of our members here, each of us have got strengths and weaknesses and we need to celebrate that rather than feeling like with this learner profile, you don't need to max out your learner profile. It's not the goal of every student to get the highest result in every capability because that's not a reality. Then when we look at our stakeholders or end users, we have been working with the tertiary institutions to say, what's a good fit? 
I'm not looking for a 99.95, actually. I'm looking for a strength in uh, personal enterprise and ethical understanding, because that's really a really strong predictor of successful students in engineering. So now we're not looking for the highest score or a cutoff. We're looking for better matching of capabilities and qualities to the sort of skills required in a, um, a tertiary degree or a course. So it's still early days and it's a little bit ambitious, but I think that's where we're going. So our thing is let's value the learning and capability in of its own sake and not make this another competition as someone in the chat suggests. And then I think I'll just summarise by saying if you are an academic, if you are a teacher, if you are interested in this space, reach out to us because we would love to have more conversations. I think every time we sit down to chat about this, we add something new to the conversation. Um, and I think it's a, an ever-growing uh, space. And I think we could use some different voices in the picture as well. So if you're interested in this space, then please reach out to us. Um, we'd love to chat in whatever capacity or whatever role that you're in. I think from a research base, we would love that. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. And then thanks to Simon and Tony. It was really great to have you discuss this. I guess we have a yeah, fair a lot of work to do here in this area of, of uh, you know, first of all, having all of this you know, theoretical and, and, and uh, you know, baseline of, of setting up the, the constructs and how we're going to measure them and so on, but then is obviously how we're going to teach that and uh, the role of AI and other new technologies in, in, in that area. Um, I hope this was useful for everybody and definitely useful for me and learn many new things uh, and really, you know, hear perspective from, from, uh, from, from different angle because one thing is when you're involved as academic and it's, it's a bit different when you are, uh, trying to view it from a system level or from a school level. And um, thank you so much for joining the session, and I hope you guys enjoyed the rest of the conference. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Everyone. guys. And join Vita's keynote tonight about learner uh, profiles. Yeah. <laughs>